Hello everybody and welcome on to the webinar today. My name is Stephen Ball and I'm going to be just kicking us off here as we find out what's new in Rad Studio 11.3 Alexandria. So for those of you who have been following the 11 series quite closely, uh, we're going to have a, a little bit of a recap through today and some of the updates that have come through 11 and also drive into the latest things within 11.3, uh, including some platform updates and some very interesting bits um, around how the IDE is working under the hood. Uh, all great things for helping improve the quality and the stability and the developer productivity that you experience with Rad Studio. So joining us online today, we have product managers Marco Cantu and David Millington, uh, lead chief developer advocate Jim McKeith, and also Carl Wheeler, who's the brand GM for Embarcadero. And myself, Stephen Ball, I'm the pre-sales director here. So I look after the technical guys who are here to help you if you're looking at upgrading and wanting to find out how to get into the latest version. So as we go through today, we are going to just touch base a little bit about what Rad Studio is. Uh, David's then going to take us through the updates to 11 and the uh, the number of little pieces that are all just adding up to a much faster, smoother developer experience. And um, we'll also going to then be looking at the Delphi platform and language and um, some of the updates that have come through, uh, including some very interesting updates that Marco, um, so David's going to then come take us through on the uh, LLDB, the debugging engine that has uh, been changed within 11.3, uh, and also the, the tools API. So I'd definitely highlight that as things to watch out for as we go through. At the end, we will have a live Q&A. So please, if you're watching this live, go ahead and use the GoToWebinar chat panel to add in your questions as we go. And uh, we will focus on getting those answered at the end of the demos. OK, so let's have a, a quick look at Idera today. Um, we are Embarcadero is part of the Idera group and we sit within the developer tools division uh, and within there there's a number of additional developer tools which is brilliant because uh, as a group we get a broad sense of feedback across the market in terms of what developers are asking for and driving for and that helps improve the tools uh, across the division and we, we can see that through uh, things like uh, Whole Tomato, uh, Ultra Edit which are, are leading tools in their space um, Censure, which is a fantastic web framework, which is available within the Architect Edition uh, of Rad Studio. And we've got FileStack, which is one of the leading APIs behind a, a stack of the leading social media networks out there. Uh, API Layer, which is a marketplace that developers can bring their APIs to to help monetize them and take them forward. Um, you know, so all these different uh, companies and brands around the group are a really great way to be able to help uh, expand what we can offer to our developers and also you know uh, make sense of the changing market that's out there you know being able to build your rad server api in the back end uh, and then if you've got something that is market worthy being able to take it to a brand like api layer where you can then start monetizing it um, if you're developing you know and you want to add business intelligence into your applications being able to tap into yellowfin which we have and the delphi integration that's been recently done with that you know there's a number of things that are really helping improve the the broader ecosystem for developers um, thanks to what we have within the group which is fantastic but let's focus specifically on what rad studio is and rad studio very much is the ultimate ide for building multiple platform across you know windows mac ios android and linux high performance native applications and this is one of the most important parts really you know there's value in native um, and speed, the performance, but most importantly with today's marketplace, the security you get from compiled code rather than interpreted code, um, the, the speed, performance and the, the scalability that you get through being native is just something that is highly important to the market. And this is all available with our modern Object Pascal and our extended C++ languages. And this couples up with the powerful visual design tools that we've had and everything integrated into a single tool chain um, that makes it very, very 
fast to develop applications and to get concepts to market, to collaborate with wider team members uh, and to get going. And that is really seen when we look at what is great within Rad Studio. You know, because of the frameworks, because of the strong object oriented backgrounds and the interfaces and the designs, it allows us to build cross-platform native applications in a way that allows you to ship and get features to market at least five times faster than with other tools. And the compilers that we have are fast, they allow you to get the speed and performance of the metal that you're compiling onto. And all of this with great access to all the APIs on the platforms. You know, one of the great things about the component architecture that's used through FireMonkey, through v, uh, VCL, uh, and through the, uh, the core runtime libraries that we have is that you know, the use of interfaces and object design allow you as a developer just to be able to say, hey, can I support this interface here? Can I use this component? And then on the platform, getting the rendered uh, or the uh, the runtime version that is specific for that platform with the same interface. So just as if you were um, using a steering wheel to drive a car or to turn a boat, uh, you know, the interface is the same regardless of the platform that you're running on underneath and you know that makes it so much quicker and easier to code debug and to ensure that you provide you know to whichever platform the same features at the same time and this is all backed up thanks to the, the great visual designers that we have the ability to use a live preview against devices at the same time as you're coding it within the IDE uh, thanks to Fire UI uh, blazingly fast database connectivity, um, which has had a number of updates throughout the 11 series as well, um, with a full REST MEEP backend that's available to you as well to be able to code exceptionally fast for you know, multi-platform remote applications as well. And you know, this is all backed up with uh, a strong developer community, and we have a, a, a huge developer network of MVPs around the world, trainers, book authors, third-party component vendors and tech partners. But one of the most important things, especially that we hear time and time again, is the cost of investment into code can be substantial. Yet the backward compatibility that Rad Studio brings you is huge. Uh, and the ability to move code that is even you know, 20, 25 years old forward to the latest versions relatively quickly is immense and that is something that you just don't see across the market where technologies and frameworks are constantly changing um, the strong ethos we have with backward compatibility here means that you can drive your code forward for a long time uh, which means your investment is is very strong which is why we see today rad studio is used across a broad spectrum of use cases in the market um, you know i've had the pleasure of traveling around the world talking to lots of different developers i've heard stories of how it's being used in television i've used seen how it's being used in stock exchanges to enable and for frequent high frequency trading um, we've heard how it's being used in uh, uh, in kind of black boxes and uh, for airplanes we've heard how it's being used to you know automate milking of cows with 3d cameras connected up and a whole load of other things um, there's amazing use cases around the world today um, from music to film production to healthcare to point of sale to uh, remote computer access to you know even developing other tools for developers. And it really is uh, amazing how much and how broad you can go with Rad Studio. So pretty much, can you use it? Pretty much anywhere, yes. Um, there's no business segment today where Rad Studio isn't present. So right now I'm gonna hand over to David to take us through a high level overview of what's been in Rad Studio 11. Before we get into what's new in 11.3, Let's quickly look at what we've introduced in the 11.x generation of Delphi and C++ Builder. The Rad Studio IDE now fully supports high DPI displays, including moving across displays with different DPIs, designing forms at high DPI, and even having the designer on a separate window on another screen to have both the form and code visible at once, similar to what you could do with the old undocked layout. Visual design and prototyping is key to the Delphi and C++ Builder way of doing things, and so it's important that what you see on screen in the Visual Form Designer is similar to what you see when your application runs. 
The form designer now supports themes, the same as your apps do, and that includes having multiple themes in the same form on different controls at design time. We also introduced a new welcome page. The old one was based on an HTML view, the new one is built in the VCL. The VCL is a great technology and the new welcome page is an excellent showcase for what you can achieve with it. It's both visually stunning, but also flexible in layout and contents, and you can write your own content using the Tools API. The IDE got a new look and feel quite some time ago, but we continue to refine it every release. In 11.x we made it much easier to differentiate different kinds of tabs, such as source control tabs versus com related tabs. We also added more information to the tab. You can see if a tab was opened while debugging, has been modified, or is read-only. Finally, you can customize when the X close button appears on tabs, which was a common request. The IDE now also supports Markdown documents, both rich previews and editing them. Markdown is a very common readme file format, and most projects you get from GitHub or other locations will include Markdown files. You can set one as the default readme for a Rad Studio project too, so if you distribute your code you can make sure a rich markdown readme displays when other people open your project. Code Insight, such as code completion and control click navigation, tooltips over symbols and so forth, is very important to productivity, and so it's very important to us. Several years ago we changed Delphi's Code Insight system to something we call Delphi LSP. LSP is a protocol that lets us separate the IDE from the system that generates the Code Insight data. This has a number of advantages. It improved IDE stability, but also greatly improved performance. The IDE never pauses while calculating, which means you can keep typing. It's hard to remember now, but just a few years ago, the IDE used to stop responding to your keys when showing code completion. Not anymore. Code Insight results are calculated in a separate process, plus they are more accurate including the errors, warnings, and hints displayed in the editor. In fact, being able to display warnings and hints in the editor is new as well. And you can use code completion or other code insight features while debugging. We also brought back XSLT transforms for XML doc documentation. You may not use this, but it's very useful for those who do, and allows you to change what and how tooltips display information about symbols in the IDE. And we added a new editor feature, where code that is not compiled, that is inactive, is visually displayed as inactive in the code editor. We discussed Delphi LSP quality later on in this webinar, but 11.3 has had a huge overhaul of quality, and you should find that in Delphi 11.3, Code Insight and Delphi LSP works better than it ever has. Finally, the Red Studio IDE has had a number of other really useful enhancements in the 11.x generation. The CPU disassembly view when debugging syntax highlights CPU code. Get it filtering has improvements. The compile messages are displayed in different colors depending on if they are hints, warnings, or errors. The compiled dialog displays the platform and build config and more. All of these are quality of life enhancements things that are designed to help you find or understand what you see on screen more easily. We hope some of them you won't even notice. You might not notice that the compiler output now displays errors in red, for example, that's just there and seems natural. The consistent message here is that the IDE is constantly developed and improved in a wide variety of ways that modernize and assist productivity. We also had a strong C++ quality focus in 11.x. We had a dedicated C++ builder release between 11.1 and 11.2, which we called 11.1.5, with a focus on code completion. That was rolled into 11.2 as well. There have also been a number of other improvements around STL quality and performance, a notable example being a four times performance improvement in IO streams. Integrating record helpers from Delphi so the same methods can be called from C++. Improvements with data alignment, quality in the linker and delay loading and more, including support for address space layout randomization or ASLR and other key PE flags. The LLDB debugger we use for C++ on Win64 now also supports remote debugging for Win64. Thanks David. This is Marco and I'm going to continue driving you through some of the features introduced in Delphi 11 Alexandria 
recent releases. On the Delphi compiler side, we have introduced new support for macOS 64-bit ARM, the new M1, M2 CPUs that power the current breed of macOS devices. And we have also added support for iOS simulator on the same hardware in 11.2 release alongside adding support for Android API level 32, which is currently mandatory for the Google Play Store. We've also improved our support for different PE security flags, including address space layout randomization, data execution prevention, and high entropy ASLR in Win64. Now notice that having enabled these flags not only as options in the compiler, but as default in the compiler, and having enabled them in our own RAS Studio IDE, there is a chance that a wrong pointer cast, which was still acceptable without these configurations, would now turn into an access violation or a memory error. So you need to be careful when migrating your code to these new settings because anything that was a bit borderline but still legal on the old traditional compiler configuration is now not allowed for security reasons by the operating system. In general terms, even if not in 11, there have been some notable changes in the Delphi language in case you missed them. Manage records with automatic invocation of initialization and finalization code and copy operations among records. Inline variables, which not only offer a convenient syntax, but an additional scope and lifetime for variable, plus the ability to use type inference for a variable declaration. Now, specifically in 11, we added support for binary literals and for digit separators. So the ability to use an underscore to separate large numbers and make them more readable to the user, not to the computer. Outside of the core compiler, we've added a lot of low-level features to our runtime library, including improvement to the tzip file class, the introduction of new classes, t no reference count object, t url stream, t pointer stream, and proxy subrange stream, and several performance optimization throughout some of the core and most commonly used RTL functions. On the VCL side, we introduced a new implementation for ReachEdit based on, on a more modern version of the operating system control and several changes and improvements in the Win API support. There have been many enhancements around scaling, multi-monitor support and high DPI support in the VCL. And we released a demo on how to build a WinUI 3 application in VCL. Finally, we've round up and improved the TH browser and TWeb browser components. TH browser is our component that embeds the WebView 2 control from Microsoft, which is basically an instance of Edge powered by Chromium. On the FarmMonkey side, there's been a number of desktop and mobile improvements. We also introduced support in TWeb browser for WebView 2, matching the features on the VCL side. We've improved the support for Windows High DPI and focused on the quality and performance of the path data class and path rendering on screen. In FireDuck, we have several new database versions supported across the 11 Alexandria series and added support for migration from ADO, from DBGO, to FireDuck through a refined script improve some of the tools that you use, including the SQL editor and the FIDAC monitor. On Run Server, we introduce sysadmin endpoints and the ability to deploy Run Server Lite, a free feature-limited version of Run Server that can be deployed to all of your customers who need it. We've also done further improvements on MIME support in HTTP client library and for SSL certificates. 
Now with that covered, let's focus on the specific theme of this webinar, which is 11.3, the new release we just made available yesterday to all of our customers. 11.3 is really a quality focus release. There are a handful of new features. There are some nice usability improvements, but the core of the work that was done by R&D is really on quality. And this presentation will highlight the features more than the improvements. We'll list some, but it's hard to go through all of them as a really a large number of improvements and fixes and quality and performance enhancements. So let's start anyway with the new features, what's new in Rust Studio 11.3 Alexandria. And I'll start by covering the additionally supported versions of the target platforms. There are no new target platforms, but there are enhancements on the targets that we support. The main reason is that Apple and Google released officially new versions of their operating system since Rust Studio 11.2 release. So now Delphi has support for iOS 16. On the C++ side, we're still working on this support. And currently, C++ can only target iOS 15 SDK. We have support for Android 13 and macOS Ventura. We've also added official support for server-side platforms, namely Ubuntu 22 and Windows Server 2022. One new small feature is the biometric authorization component available for mobile applications in FarmMonkey. It provides a means of authorize a user using the biometric APIs provided by each of the platforms, which basically means you can use Face ID on iOS devices and you can use the fingerprint authorization on uh, Android devices. On Android, actually, we added a few more device integration features, including a new phone dialer integrated service and a new document file provider. And with that, I'll let David continue with some of the changes in the toolchain. Red Studio has a number of toolchain improvements. We support the new notarization process that Apple introduced with Xcode 14. You can now timestamp MSIX files when building from within the IDE, and we support an automatic version suffix in C++ Builder. This is a very useful feature when upgrading packages and libraries, in that it's normal to name packages with the version of Delphi or C++ Builder therefore, to ensure the right one is used by your apps or installed into the IDE. But in the past, when upgrading projects, you had to manually update the version suffix in the project file. Now it can automatically reflect the version of Red Studio you're using, which helps speed up the upgrade process. Delphi already supported this, and now C++ Builder does too. Next, debuggers. We have a new LDB-based debugger for macOS Intel and Android 32-bit. This is part of our transition to LLDB. We've spoken about this over the past couple of years in these webinars, Several years ago, we had about eight different debuggers across the various platforms and businesses we supported. It made feature parity difficult, and meant quality fixes often only applied to a single platform. We've worked to add Delphi front-end support to LLDB, which is one of the world's best debuggers, and is part of us leveraging the LVM ecosystem. And we've been moving to use a single debugger or a recent version of LLDB across all our platforms. This means, with some minor caveats around some things including debug info format and so forth, we can write a feature or solve a bug once and have it apply across all platforms, which is a major advantage for quality and productivity for you. And as of Red Studio 11.3, we now use the same debugger for every non-Windows platform, including C++ and Delphi languages, across macOS, iOS, Android and Linux as the various languages support them, plus Windows 64-bit for C++. Having a single debugger for every non-Windows platform across both the Delphi and C++ languages is a major milestone and should really help the consistency of the experience of using those platforms. Over to the IDE, and we've made a massive number of fixes and improvements. While most are invisible and are around high DPI support, stability and more, one small visible area is that we have updated some of the last low DPI icons, such as the ones for sync edit or control flow in the editor. 
Now you may have noticed that in recent versions we've been steadily adding features to the code editor. Whether it's an expanded status bar with more controls, or expanding error insights not to show errors but also warnings and hints, or drawing inactive code differently as we saw in the 11.x review a few minutes ago. In 11.3 we have another new editor feature. The code editor can now automatically highlight other instances of the same word on screen. This is a very popular feature in other editors. You can see in the screenshot on the left that the text caret is in the F find handle symbol inside the post message call at the bottom, and the other two instances of F find handle are highlighted. This is useful to let you see what other code interacts with the same symbols, variables, or methods that you're currently working with, and is a quick visual connection to spot related code on screen. I'll demo this live in a moment. There are a few other smaller IDE changes. We now show when the IDE is being run with admin privileges by putting administrator in the title bar. This is helpful to know if what you do with the IDE or with a debug process which might inherit the permissions has more privileges than you intended, or when it runs might affect running the IDE or app later with normal permissions. Markdown files can now be opened in multiple editor windows. There's now an easy way to locate the output binary from your build in Explorer, similar to finding the location of your current unit in Explorer, by right-clicking the applicable build config. I'll demo this too in a moment. The inactive code feature we introduced in 11.2 now has a setting to control how transparent the inactive code is drawn. Finally, we no longer ship subversion DLLs with the IDE. This matches our support for Git and Mercurial, where you need to install them and then point the IDE to where they're located. We've changed this for Subversion 2 in order to let you use whichever Subversion build you prefer, and also to ensure that we don't ship outdated DLLs. This is mostly a feature change that helps administrators of large networks, or admins that run audits for app security. In a sense, these are all quite small IDE additions. Through this, I want to emphasize that this really shows our quality focus. We've put an enormous amount of effort into 11.3, and the smaller number of new features reflects the larger number of key quality improvements that we've focused on. 11.3 really is a quality-focused release, and in a sense, the features we've added and the number of features really demonstrates that, in that they show the proportion of time we've allocated to improving what's already there and making 11.3 really shine. Now that said, I'm going to move on to one of the more major additions to the IDE, a new feature I myself have wanted for many years and am really excited by, but I must caution it won't apply to everyone. And though we're demoing this in the new features section of this webinar, it's driven by a quality focus, only this time by helping quality in our interactions with third-party software. I'll show some small but neat IDE features with a focus on the Tools API. It's important to remember that 11.3 has a wide focus, so this is just a subset of what's coming soon. The Tools API is a set of interfaces we provide that lets you write plugins or add-ons for the IDE itself. We view the Tools API as key because it lets you, or anyone, extend to the IDE. If you find something that you want to be different or you think could be done better, you can write code that lives in the Dolphy and C++ Builder IDE and implements that. The Tools API is very comprehensive. You can write new dockable windows, you can access the debuggers, you can write a different code completion engine, you can add new options dialog page. Pretty much whatever you want to do, the Tools API lets you do it. That's why it matters to the future of Delphi, because we believe helping you write tools and improve productivity or customize your working environment is important. I said the Tools API is very comprehensive, and it is. But until 11.3, there was one area it didn't give much access to, the code editor. And the code editor is a really useful place for plugins because it's the main place you interact with and see information. Lots of plugins work in the IDE's code editor, but they currently all use hacks to access it, and that can also reduce the IDE stability. So in 11.3, which is a quality-driven release, we have a new feature that will help improve stability as plugins move away from hacks towards using the new official API. Plus, it's a really powerful API to use. The new interfaces live in toolsapi.editor.paz. There's a vast amount of information you can query about the editors and their contents, about what is visible on screen and drawn where, which I'm simply not going to show today because of time. 
There's also a wide variety of events. You can have events called when scrolling, resizing, when regions are collapsed, and so forth. We have extensive documentation showing how to use these that will be made live when 11.3 is released, and that includes three demo apps. I'm going to show you only one demo app today. Here I have a method in a plugin that's called when the editor is painting text, that is, painting the syntax highlighted code on screen. You can use this event to change or completely replace the code that's painted. First, to change it. Comments are green, and maybe I think that's boring, they should be red. So this intercepts before the editor does its painting, sets the font color to red, but does nothing else. That means the editor goes on to do its default painting, but you've changed the font color it will use when it paints. Let's have a look. There are lots of green comments on screen. What happens when I install the plugin? And there we go. Here I want to show you two other new editor features. Firstly, highlighting matching words. There is a method parameter context. Look how when the cursor is in the word context anywhere on screen, the other places context is located are highlighted. For this demo, I have this configured to happen as I move the cursor. But by default, in other words, when you install 11.3, it only happens when double-clicking or selecting a word. I personally like it more responsive, but the default setting is to only happen when selecting something. Second, what if you want to know where your output binary is located? You've been able to find a unit or the project file location for some time by choosing Show in Explorer from the context menu, but they have a fixed location whereas the output binary can be in different locations depending on the build configuration settings. So in 11.3, you can right click on build config and click show in Explorer, and it will show the built binary. Finally, a quick note about Delphi LSP. We've worked on quality for it heavily this release and it's working really well. All right, let's go back to the editor tools API. Now let's do something a bit more dramatic for the editor override its painting completely. Let's say I'm a fan of Leonardo da Vinci who famously wrote everything reversed, and I think that all the reserved words like procedure, begin, end, if, else, and so forth, should be highlighted and written backwards. To do this, I'll paint the text myself, and then after that, set allow default painting to false to tell the editor that I've painted so there's no need for it to do any painting at all. Let's try that. Beautiful. All those reserved words are drawn backwards and highlighted. This is a great productivity boost if you're a Renaissance era artist, not so much for the rest of us, but you can see from this demo that you can do anything you want in the editor. In fact, this demo shows only a small amount of what you can do. It's such a good API that we changed some of our editor features to use this API too. Both error insight and matching highlighted words both use it. We got a good performance boost by doing that as well. This small demo is one of three that we ship in 11.3, and the other two demos are even cooler. There's comprehensive documentation of the new API as well. We hope third-party plugins switch to it to improve stability, and also because it's so flexible and you can do so much, we're really looking forward to seeing what you create with it. In terms of quality, in the visual control library, we've made several improvements related with VCL styles. We have better support for styling the background of the touch keyboard component, you can see here. And we made many other fixes in the VCL style support, improving the style hook stability. We have also made change related to high DPI, for example, improving the T hotkey and T score bar standalone component. We've also added a new feature to the VCL library, namely the T control list component now offers multiple selection. Let me actually show you this multi list control demo in action. The control has only a single label as hosted component. As you can see in the code, each label is modified with an individual caption. Now, in the specific case, the control has 100 items, but the beauty of this control is that it scales incredibly well because it's virtualized, so I can actually 
add 100,000 items and have the application running. Generally speaking, this control has a single selection, so you select one item and only one is selected. I can turn on multiple selection and at this point I can control click or shift click to select multiple contiguous or non contiguous element and of course I can also unselect them in the same way. This is achieved by turning on and off the multi-select property of the control and navigating the control list selected property to see for each of the item if it's currently active or not. Now getting to FireMonkey, we also added a lot of improvements across different platforms. For Windows in particular, we improved the terminate requests from Windows Restart, accessibility, browser integration, and support for multiple displays. For iOS, we improved some of the scrolling behavior. For Android, we improved entering text in the memo. And in general terms, we improved FireMonkey graphic. Fi we added fixes for many controls listed here. Improve how Clip Children takes care of rounded corners and improve the tab key cycling across user interface controls. In terms of runtime library, we worked around some change to Android memory allocation to help improve the performance and did some other core RTL performance improvements to methods like move, to directory get files and initialize array. We're now also shipping an updated version of the Zlib library. For database in general and Fardac in particular, we improved our integration with PostgreSQL, offering full compatibility with the latest versions and new performance improvements, which can be obtained by customizing the value of the fast fetch mode setting in the connection string. For Oracle and other databases, we handle column with square brackets in their names better. And for Linux, we offer preliminary support for UTF-8 in the database RTL. We also made tbinding expression case sensitive because that's more in line with the Pascal language. Rust Studio 11.3 Alexandria now includes Interbase 2020 Update 4 Developer Edition and the matching version of the IB Lite IB2Go Edition. IB Lite is free to deploy across all platforms while IB2Go is available for enterprise customers for Android and iOS. Finally, there are specific improvements related to the, our web HTTP subsystems, including improvements in T multipart content parser, a significant number of improvements around open authentication to clients or OAuth2. The OAuth2 authenticator handles refresh, but there are several other changes that would let you better handle login and authentication via Google, Facebook, or other providers. We added improvements to the way we handle nested elements in the REST response dataset adapter, the component that helps you take a JSON response from a REST request and populate a Friday mem table. Finally, there are fixes in RAD server, in SOAP, and other related subsystems. Also, we keep shipping newer versions of Uppercepts AWS SDK for Delphi. They are continuously available in GetIt. So there's been several new changes since the 11.2 release, and more will be coming shortly for customers on active update subscription and with an enterprise license of Delphi. Overall, Rust Studio 11.3 implements over 23 feature requests that came from our customers via Quality Portal and fixes over 400 bugs reported by customers on the site. This change and fixes encompass all areas of the product. Now, if we consider all of the quality fixes done throughout the 11X series that you can see listed here, we get to a total that just short of 3,000 issues reported by customers that have been addressed in the 11 Alexandria series of the product. Now it's time for Q&A. If you have any questions and you're joining us live, 
put your questions in the question panel, and we'll do our best to get them answered for you. It looks like David Millington, um, Stephen Ball, and Marco Cantu are on there, as well as myself, Jim McKeith, and our new product manager, Nuno. I don't know, uh, if Marco, do you want to introduce Nuno really quick, and he can tell us a little about himself? Oh, sure. Sure, no, no, it's the new PM on uh, in the group, uh, helping myself and David to uh, manage um, Raw Studio. We also manage other products uh, outside of Raw Studio, but um, of course we are here as um, for for our focus. Uh, Nuno is also helping specifically on the on more on the C plus plus side, but eventually he'll get to learn uh, a bit of everything, like like all other PMs do. Right. Well, yeah. Going to a question, you, I've answered. Well, probably too many, and sorry if it would if I I was a bit going size and and short. Um, there are a couple I wanted to 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 reiterate um, uh, to to clarify. Um, first, the um, the the road, the question about having public roadmaps. It's um it's a idea uh, decision not to generally have public roadmaps. Um, we fully understand that customers want to want to know what's coming along for the product and and which are the plans. We occasionally mention plans and and ideas. We did, for example, mention some of the plans in the recent um, DelphiCon uh, event uh, just just two weeks ago. Uh, but in general terms, the process that that the company favors is to ask customers um, who are interested in understanding the roadmap and suggesting um, specific features for the roadmap to reach out to PMs and set up a meeting or conversation. And we are very open to that. So just email either myself, David, Nuno, Sarina, who's still partially helping <laughs> drive the product or anyone else at the company or even a sales representative and ask to be put in touch with, with a PM to have a, a roadmap related meeting and discussion. We are, we are very open to it. There's a comment here about. Um, oh, I misread that. Never mind. There's a few questions about specific bugs. Always the way to, thing to do with there is to submit it on Quality Portal and with a or go search Quality Portal and if they're voted up or comment on the existing one, and if it's not, then make a new submission. I have been guilty of before saying, why isn't this bug fixed? And find out I'm the only one that knows anything about it. <laughs> um, Jim, just I did just for the Q&A, would you mind putting up a slide on the screen? The, the screen is blank currently. I can't Maybe share a screen. A slide or, or a summary slide or, or something like that. I can't share screen, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, I can make someone else a presenter to share screen, but I can't share screen. I can do it. Give me a one minute. Awesome. Thanks. I could turn on my video. Oh, no, I can't. Webcam quit working. Uh, I did just put a blog post up. Actually, I'll, I'll share a link for that that walks through the process of maintaining your GitHub packages when you upgrade from 11.2 to 11.3. Uh, so let me grab that real quick and put that in the, the, uh, in the chat log for everybody. Uh, there's a couple questions here about RAD server and data snap updates. Marco, can you uh, address that? What what recent RAD server and data snap updates we've had? Yeah, there's been some improvements and fixes on both. Uh, RAD server is the technology we are fully maintaining and improving over time. Uh, we had a few new features in 11.2. Um, not much new in 11.3, save for, for quality fixes. Uh, for DataSnap, at this point, we don't expect to build any new feature in it. 
but really more focused on fixing any bug or regression that happens uh, over time. David, there's a question here about code insight in C++ improvements on 11.3. There have been improvements to that area for C++ for code insight? The main set of improvements we did was in 11.1.5 and 11.2. Uh, we don't have uh, many extra improvements in 11.3 there. Uh, the main reason for that, is, as sort of mentioned in the webinars, the C++ team is, is focusing on uh, something that's coming, um, which we haven't announced yet, but I uh, just want to emphasize that uh, the team is, is busy working on something that, uh, that's very good. We also still plan to integrate Visual Assist um, into C++ Builder, and uh, one of the things I'm very hopeful for there is uh, Visual Assist completions, um, which uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to use instead of the current uh, code completion. Marco, there's a question here about the life perpetual licenses, how that works now. If, if someone buys a license, does that, it comes with update subscription, but does their software con continue to work after update subscription expires, or what does that um, entail? Sure. We have more than one option, but generally speaking, the RAS Studio licenses are perpetual licenses. So you pay for a license and that software is free for you to use for an undetermined amount of time. Um, now, when you buy Rust Studio today or Delphi or C++ Builder, you automatically have a one year update subscription that's included in the initial price. Uh, so it's not optional as it used to be. So, Beside the perpetual license, you also get one year of updates that include any minor, major updates. So it would include 11.4 if there was one, or 12.0 when there will be one, or if it's within one year from the day you bought you bought the the license. Um, so and of course, hot fixes and add-ons that are available and and bonus packs available via Get It and so forth. All of these content i don't know for example the aws sdk gets updated every every two or three months all of this is available until your your subscription is valid the day you um, your subscription expires you're still entitled to use the software but you cannot update you cannot download new updates or install new packages and uh, and so forth now we in some regions, we also set subscription licenses, which are, are completely different because they last only until the subscription is valid. And at the end of the subscription, you're not entitled to use the software anymore. And I know there's activations. Um, you can't you can have a backup, so you no longer have to get activations. But if you do use up all your activations, you can contact sales and they can bump that after your subscription's expired. Yeah, you can you can update. I mean, you can install it on more than one computer. That is by design. Although you can use it only at one computer at a time. Right. Um, but um, in case you need to install a new computer, you can get. Um, you might need to uh, uh, up bump your your current subscription, uh, your current registrations. Now, if your subscription is expired, the renewal and sales teams want to at least have a chat to understand. Um, why you're not interested anymore and so forth, but they're going to uh, to get your uh, registration bump if within limit. We've had customer requir requesting a very large number of very frequent registration bumps, and at some point they got it denied. Um, yeah, that makes sense, I guess. Um, <laughs> depending on uh could be get excessive although if you have backups i mean you really i mean i i don't like having to get my software activated but if i have a backup i can restore my backup and i'm fine so that's always an option too david there's a question here about 64-bit ide if the ide is going to be moving into 64-bit well we have nothing we can announce but i'd certainly like to do that um there are a number of issues there because uh, the IDE loads, you know, various DLLs and so forth. Um, 
you, know, you might have noticed that the Delphi compiler, for example, is still a 32-bit executable, so we need to sort of 64-bitize that, and the same for various other things like our editor and, and so forth. Um, but it would be really valuable, and I can say this is something we're definitely looking at very heavily. Uh, I can't announce it. You know, we, we have nothing to announce, um, but it's definitely something we, uh, we are looking at. There's a few comments here about rich edit and spell checking, Marco. Is that, was spell checking a new feature added to rich edit or what was the, the change about, there's some change about that apparently? Um, no, that feature was added around, um, around uh, 11.0, if I remember, uh, when we redid our, our entire rich edit implementation in VCL based on the a more recent version of the underlying uh, max of component and and dll um what happened is that um it was a bit complicated to handle both uh, the the regular uh, right click and um and the spell check uh, that's something that i think we addressed in in 11.3 but i i saw a comment saying it, it's not working or asking for more information I, i'd have to look it up um the library we use is the Microsoft system library, so we're not adding anything to the core Microsoft control in that respect. The other thing that we actually missed um, enabling the feature for the DB rich edit, the database aware rich edit, that, that was just a, uh, an oversight. Uh, this is going to be addressed, but has not been addressed in time for, for 11. There's a few questions here about certain packages being available on GitHub. I've checked and everything that was in 11.2 is available on 11.3 now and working. Um, I did notice that there's two copies of Rays, the Radiant components, the 11.2 version and the 11.3 version are both available and get it. Um, so get the one with the newer date, but everything else, everything, seems, everything else I checked seems to be, looks correct. Now there's Markdown Editor in the IDE and Preview in the IDE, but it's just editing them as text, right, David? It's not like a uh, WYSIWYG editor for Markdown? Yeah, that's right. So Markdown, I mean, Markdown is a text format, so you can just display the text in the code editor. Um, and we do have the, the rich preview for it, the one that shows all the images and formatting and so forth. Uh, but the rich preview is, is you know, read only. Uh, to edit it, you edit the, the Markdown text itself. Yeah, I, I heard someone refer to Markdown as is not being a WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get, but what you see is what you mean, which is the idea that like if you put asterisks or underlines around things and you're Im still implying what you mean, even if it's not rendered in bold or italics or whatever. So that was kind of an interesting way of looking at it. So there's a few questions here about the 64-bit compiler platforms, which target platforms we target with the 64-bit compiler, Marco. Um, what, where do we target 64-bit? And there's a question here also about the 64 or ARM Linux, I guess is what the, what it is. Yeah, I guess that that was was for Delphi. So in Delphi, we target Win64. Um, we have a compiler for Linux, which is a 64-bit Intel. Uh, Linux uh, target uh, as as a compiler. We have compile 64 bit compilers for macOS, both um, Intel and um, ARM. Uh, we have um, ARM compiler for uh, iOS 64 bit and an ARM compiler for Android uh, 64 bit. So we basically have five different platforms we can target um, building native 64 bit. Uh, applications. Sorry to interrupt. I actually have another webinar that I need to go to and present the first few minutes of. So I'm oh, going yeah, to no do problem. that, but I will be back for the rest of the Q&A in perhaps about 10 minutes. Okay. But thank you everyone for attending and I'll see you in 10 minutes if the Q&A is, is still going. Thank you, David. Um, I will try and queue up some for David while he's gone. Marco, there's a question here about notification runtime permissions in Android 13. I'll admit I had not heard about that permission. Do you know if that anything about that or if that's supported in the new release? It should be supported. Um, the problem is that the, in the past you could only just declare 
that you wanted a given permission. Now you had to provide that permission at runtime. Um, we simplified that process for a few of the permissions, but not for everything. So you might have to uh, manage um, some of the some of the permissions uh, with extra code. That was that was a few versions back, wasn't it? That was a um, yeah, yeah. It's not recent, but okay. it's been. Uh, uh, the the Google has been strengthening the the, yeah. the the entire permission thing, so asking for more uh, strict control and permission, and also when as you update the API targets and so forth, then that those permissions become uh, uh, a requirement. Uh, so. The actual permission depend on a mix of the target version of Android and the API version, so your declared version of your applic application, um, and the combination of the two has has an imp. So, changing the operating system, but also changing the API target, uh, you need to uh, update um, some of the some of the code run permissions. And so, eleven. All right, thank you. 11.2 and 11.3 is a minor update in that you can't, they can't coexist, but they are DCU and BPL compatible. Is that right, Marco? That's that's true. And same for 11.1 and 11.0. So all of the 11 series, you can only have one on, on a machine, of course, if you have DMs, you can have, you can have multiple, uh, but on a single computer, you can only have one and they are uh, DCU compatible. I'm not sure if it's the same person or multiple people have asked about FireMonkey 3D support. It, is that something, are we planning to make any changes to that or have there been changes to that recently? It's an area we have made of only a few minor fixes. Um, there are a few issues that we want to address. Um, we haven't focused a lot on FireMonkey 3D. We don't see a ton of usage. Uh, but it's something we want to get back. So I, I'm, I'm personally interested in 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 un better understanding what was the use case scenario. If you're using FireMonkey 3D and and what for and and what are your needs and requirements, so we can try to make sure that uh, we keep it moving in, in the right direction. Oh gosh, there's Gorilla 3D and then Castle Game Engine as well are two really nice. Um, 3D game engines that work with Delphi that might possibly be solutions too. So depending on what you're trying to accomplish, just know there are other options as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, the FireMonkey 3D who has, has its own specific goals and areas. Of course, if you if you need them for a, like scientific 3D or, or or game 3D, that that's there are specific libraries for that, and and good there are some very good ones as as you were mentioning. Java supports, for example, a null integer, which raises issues when using tjson, json to object. Does 11.3 handle a null integer in json, apparently? Um, no. We, we've had a plan to introduce the concept of null at the language level in Delphi, um, but that's not something we are we are uh, we are managing today. Um, so if you're doing any mapping of data from I mean from JSON to actual to actual uh, variables or objects and so forth, you'd have to consider handling nulls um, uh, in a custom way. So the question here, Mark says, I'm not fond of how the versioning is stored in the dproj file. It would be great if it was stored in a separate file that is easy to update for automated builds. Does such functionality exist that I'm not aware of, or can such functionality be added? No, right now we, I mean, the, the dproj file has a lot of information that are managed that way because it's also an MS build file. Um, We've been discussing alternative approaches, uh, but um, nothing really on on the table right now. Uh, there is a on DocWiki. There's a list of all the fixes. I believe that has that been updated, Marco. The what's fixed in uh, eleven three? Yeah, there is a document on DocWiki with a list of fixes in eleven three. Also, since this morning. The actual uh, items addressed in 11.3, well, say the majority 
of the issues addressed in 11.3 as the status reflected in Quality Portal. So if you go on Quality Portal, you can see some 600 issues addressed between yesterday and today, which doesn't mean they were addressed by yesterday and today. It means they, they are addressed in the 11.3 release that was that happened um, yesterday. The list is not complete. There are still a few issues that we think are addressed but are currently under uh, under verification by QA so until we don't have uh, full testing we don't we don't um, I mean, we don't we don't change the status but expect a, f a handful more uh, to uh, to be marked as fixed in in, in 11 in the next week or so but again the the quality portal status has been reflected um, from the internal JIRA. So now you can just check the, the issues on Quality Portal if you prefer. So there's a question I'm going to answer that says, uh, which is the best reporting tool to use with Delphi, Fast Reports, Rave, Quick Reports, etc.? cetera? Uh, the answer is uh, whichever one works best for you. <laughs> uh, each one provides something differently. Uh, you're gonna have to look at that and see, although you probably could do a poll and get different people's opinions and such on that. but. Uh, I don't know that there is ever really a best one. Uh, someone asked me about anything about Bluetooth LE has changed in this release. I uh, didn't see, uh, so is, oh, 11.3, does 11.3 have any updates to Bluetooth LE? Um, I don't remember if there are any fixes to it. Uh, I would not call them uh, updates. Uh, uh, the compiler directive lib suffix is handy for changing the DLL output name. Example, track tacking on 64 for 64 bit targets. Any similar, anything similar for an EXE name automatically renaming? I really don't know. Uh, is there plans to target ARM Windows? It's a platform that is being discussed, but but really nothing to announce at this point. Uh, again, it, it's another case where we'd be interested in understanding if you have specific requests, specific customer that need it today. Uh, if it's more a uh, uh, desire to have it in the future, or, or, or which type of priority and relevance um, there is, because well, of course, if we introduce it, we're not putting the same effort on some other platforms or, or features that are that are. We also have requests for so uh, very interested to to get specifics about uh, about the requirement. Um, there's a question here about the Python components and Git it asking for a webinar. I've done a few webinars on that. I'll do another one. They're available on our YouTube channel, and there'll be more Python components coming soon. Um, let's see. Any thoughts on adding IB Light and IB to Go projects as new project types? Um, we've been considering enhancing the recent FireMonkey wizard into with with more extensive database integration and like like a sort of database wizard uh, that that could handle it. Uh, but adding adding IB Light and IB to Go is really quite straightforward. You just need to drop the um, uh, FireDuck connection, configure it as being local, and then we have deployment support uh, part of the of the deployment for for IB Light, IB to Go. Well, you only need to drop in your license key uh, of one of the two. And uh, actually, IB Light doesn't even need one. The the standard default one is already enabled. So it should be fairly fair, for, um, simple to, to, to build a new um, IB Light, IB to go application. Okay. Uh, there's a couple of comments here about people that have bought MacBooks, or new Macs with M1 or M2 processors and asking about running Windows or Delphi in a virtual machine. I've used Parallels, it's not an officially. So Microsoft doesn't officially support that as a platform officially. It does work fine, and everything I've tested seems to work pretty good. I've installed Delphi on it and used Delphi in parallels on um, Windows. It's technically, I think it's a Windows preview that runs in that regard, but 
but I saw an article recently about Microsoft is going to work with Parallels to make Parallels virtual machine on Mac ARM, an officially supported platform. So uh, just that is coming apparently. I don't think that's been released yet, but like I said, I've tested it and it has worked well. Okay, so yeah, I think I think we um, we actually need to 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 wrap it it up. Um, it as some people are mentioning, there is um, now compatibility for running Windows ARM on Parallels, and um, we know that a few people are actually running Word Studio on Parallels on um, M1 devices. So it is working, although it's not officially supported by by us. Um, it is a scenario that is reported to be working by a few of our customers. And in terms of Windows ARM support, um, of course, we are aware it, it exists and Microsoft is pushing it. It's also released specific hardware with um, for Windows ARM. Um, we don't think it is at this point extremely popular and it offers a fairly good level of compatibility with, um, with uh, Intel. Uh, 64-bit and 32-bit application. It was originally only 32-bit. Um, no, that doesn't mean that it's, it's not important. It is not something we are we are looking into. We we are, but um, it we I, we don't feel there is the same urgency uh, we had to make sure that we had a solution for Apple ARM because that was the only option uh, and the only hardware. Apple uh, started shipping since um, over a year ago, so we felt it was quite critical to be to have a um, native ARM, App, App, Apple ARM capability available. Uh, Intel applications run on on macOS ARM, but they are really second class citizen uh, at this point, uh, unlike on Windows. Um, okay, yeah, thanks a lot for, for the many questions and uh, um, we'll, we'll go through the list and we might answer a few more, um, although, yeah, I, I think a hundred, I answer probably a hundred of them. And um, I'm, I'll, again, I'll make sure I go through them. Uh, feel free to reach us over email, over social media, over any other uh, avenue you have. <laughs> Um, Marco.cantu at embarcadero.com, david.millinton at embarcadero.com, Jim McKeith at embarcadero.com, and, and say for, for um, uh, Kyle Wheeler, who is our, our general manager for the, for the group. Um, so thanks a lot for attending. Uh, if you have a license, uh, download 11.3. There were some hiccups in the installation due to a server that got significantly overloaded by too many requests that from from what I've heard has been working much better over the last couple of hours and should should remain working better now. Um, so feel free to um, get the new version from my.marketer.com if you are an active, a customer with an active subscription. If you don't have it, there is the trial available that's good for you to test. And also there are some quite enticing offers uh, that, are, that are being shared. If you are interested in buying a license, feel free to reach any of our resellers or internal salespeople or sales representative as um, usual, more than willing to uh, provide information as needed. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for attending this uh, webinar with a fairly long QA session and um, um, talk to you soon. Bye-bye.